really excited. This year, 2023, we are declaring is the year of, what is it? The year of focus. The year of focus. And I believe, you guys, like, I'm going to tell you why this is so important and lead you through over the next several weeks um, what I believe if, if, like, the tools and the targets to make this the best year of your life. Like, if you could just get your life in focus... This could be the best year of your life. Let me begin with a very familiar verse for some of you in Isaiah. It says this, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Come on, amen, somebody. There are some things that you need to let go of that happened in 2022. Some hurts, some habits, some pains, some disappointments, some missed expectations that you cannot bring. Why? Why? Because God says, I want to do a new thing. God has a clean slate here. You got a clean slate with 2020. I love the new year. God loves doing a new thing. He says, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Like, like I'm doing a new thing, but I need you to focus because you got to see what I'm doing. Okay. He says, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So where other people are experiencing like, like wandering in, in a wilderness, God says, I'll show you the way if you'll focus. If you have the right perception, if you can see it, I'll show you the way where other people wander and meander all throughout this year. I'll show you the way where other people experience drought. There'll be streams of living water for you, and it's all connected to what? To your focus. To what you, can you, can you perceive it? Can you actually see the new thing that God, the new opportunities, the new adventures, the, the new commitments, the new steps that God wants you to take in this year? Your focus determines your future. Your focus determines your future. But this world is, is full of distractions. 2023 has its share of landmines and tripwire, okay? Like, like every year has them. You guys, and you probably know what a lot of them are already because you tripped over and stepped on them last year. And the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that, you guys. So, so I was actually doing some, some research on this. Um, <laughs> we, humans, humans, all of us, we pick up our phones 58 times a day. For a total of average three hours and 45 minutes a day given to our phones. That's every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes on average, we're picking up our phone and spending time on it. Now, some of you are like, well, that's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Every 10 minutes. Some of you are like, don't think that's a big deal. Well, the New York Times did a study on distractions and interruptions uh, in your work day. And they actually found that it takes 25 minutes for you to refocus after every distraction and interruption. Right? So you do the math. Like, okay, if I'm picking up my phone every 10 minutes and it takes 25 minutes to refocus, the math doesn't even make sense, but you get the picture, right? It, no wonder it feels like it's impossible to get anything done because you're so out of focus. We're so distracted. Because of the distractions, you're never focused enough to gain traction. Okay? So let me say it like this. Like, like this isn't in your notes. You may want to write this down. The devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. So that's a, like, he'll settle for that. And for a lot of you, like, you, he ain't going to destroy you, man. You like, a lot of you, like, you're like, I, I'm good. But what he can do and what he has been doing is distracting you. And you're going to be more, we got to understand this. You will be more defined by what you say no to than what you say yes to. So, so what, every time you say yes to something, you need to realize you're saying no to something else. Every yes is a no to something else. When you say yes to, like, to that covenant marriage, you said yes, you said yes to your wife or your, your husband on that, that wedding day, you said no to everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Every yes is a no to something else. If the devil, the devil doesn't need to destroy you if he can distract you. And I believe that's why, like all the goals and good intentions we begin every year with, that's why on average 80% of us fail by the second week of February. We give up entirely on every goal, every good intention we have. It is out the window before Valentine's Day for 80% of people. And we all begin the New Year clean slate. Many of us, we're wanting to start things, stop things, and they're all very familiar. Some of us want to, like, stop overeating, stop smoking or drinking or stop watching porn. And then we just kind of drift by, by Valentine's Day. We're just falling right back into it. Or some of us were like, we want to start doing some things, start some, we want to start reading the Bible, we want to start praying more, I want to, we like start working out and being out, and then we just kind of drift on away from that. Oh, I'll get better with my money, all these things. Here's what we need to do if, if, if we want to, this is the title of today's message, we got to fix our focus, write that down, fix your 
focus. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 says this. If people can't see, somebody say focus. Okay, if people can't see what God is doing, here's what's going to happen, he says. They stumble all over who? Themselves. <laughs> so who has, the, who, ha, who, who has the biggest tendency to get in your way? You. <laughs> you do. Who's your biggest enemy? You are. You're your biggest, you're your biggest enemy. If we can't see what God is doing, then, then we make what he's saying is we make a mess of it. We try to do it our own thing, our own way, operating by our own sight. Even the steps we think we should take, we think are the wise steps, actually end up in destruction and devastation in our life. And God says, lift up your eyes. Man, remember the psalmist said, I lift up my eyes into the hills from where my help comes from. There are often times you're going to go through valleys in life, and you got to lift up your eyes from the low place, the maker of heaven and earth. You see, God doesn't sit back idly and go, okay, you're going to figure it out. No, he's like, he's like, lift up your eyes. Look up. Okay, there is revelation for you. There's vision for you. God doesn't want you to stumble. He wants you to see what he's doing so you don't stumble all over yourself. And then he says this. This is what happens. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most Bless. How many of you want a most blessed year? The most blessed year that you've ever had. Okay, here's what it's going to take. It's going to take you seeing what God sees and attending to the revelation. That's what it's going to take. If you, if you can see what God is doing and attend to that, like, like, like attend to the revelation he shows, here's what he says. You're going to have the most blessed year of your life. But here's the challenge. To really see what God is doing can be hard for a lot of us. Like the God of the impossible, Right? To see what he is doing when he operates in ways, man, that are sometimes mysterious. He's like so high and above and, and yet so intentional and detailed with every individual life and, and perfect, like assignment. Like how do we see really what God is doing? I want to show you the three dimensions that God is operating in and he wants you to see in. I got some props up here. I got three props to help me out, okay? Okay, this, this first one is the telescope. The telescope takes things that are far away, and what does it do? It brings them near. It takes things that are impossible and, and makes them textual, right? It, 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 it takes the things that are incomprehensible and makes them visible, okay? That's what it does. How many things have you been missing out on that are way far out in your future that is the vision of your life, but you, can't, you haven't grasped it yet? You know, God wants to show you things that are far away. God wants to show you a vision for your life that you can't even see with your eyes. you got to see it by faith. This is where God lives. God dwells in this dimension, the dimension of the incomprehensible, the far away, the vision. Amen, somebody? Okay. The second prop I got here, this is how God, God views. God, this is the, the, the microscope. The microscope is, to, is used to, to see the things that are seemingly invisible, right? They seem like they're invisible. They're so God, we don't only want to see the things that are far away, far away and bring them close, God. I want to have eyes to see the things that are like right under my nose that are so close, a part of my daily life and my daily rhythms, but I'm looking over them. I'm not realizing them, that there are things like inside of me, God, that you want to reveal. And that you, there are things in the invisible realm that God wants to show you. How many things are you missing because you're so caught up in the temporal, in the earthly realm? You're seeing with your fleshly eyes when God wants you to see the invisible. This is where God lives. This is where the dimension God operates. He operates in the incomprehensible, the invisible. And the last one I have here that God operates in is, is this kaleidoscope. And this is to see the, the um, indescribable. When you put your eye to it, right, you got all these shapes, sizes, and colors that, that come together and blend. And, 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 and there is like, when you, when you see your life come together, different pieces and parts and pains and trials and, and, and parts of your life come together to create something beautiful, colorful, to create a tapestry of art. How many things are you missing because you are misinterpreting? You're not seeing the, the art and the beauty that God is creating out of your life, maybe even out of your pain, maybe even out of your, your past and your, and your hurts because you just get, you're not seeing with, now look, this is how God, this is the dimensions, how God operates. This is, this is like what God is operating in. And if you can't see it, the scripture says, if you can't see that, you will stumble all over yourself. Uh, wouldn't it be amazing? 
if you could actually see the impossible in your life, if you could actually see the, the incomprehensible, the indescribable, and the invisible, and to stop living your life by what your eyes can see in this temporal realm, but you would set your focus on what God sees and live your life and chart your course based upon what is impossible, what is invisible, what is indescribable, what is incomprehensible. I'm telling you, this will be the best year of your life if you get it in focus. Come on, somebody say Amen. Get in focus. Helen Keller was, a, was blind and deaf and was asked, is blindness the greatest handicap? And she replied, hey, absolutely not. not. She said this, true blindness is having sight and not being able to see. So my prayer, my prayer for us is that we would not just have eyes to behold, but to see the incomprehensible that God wants to reveal to us. The, 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 the invisible the indescribable all at the same time that God is actually operating in and he created us in such a way to have fellowship with him and to see this. He actually wants you to see this and to attend to what he reveals to you in his dimension, okay? So you don't stumble all over yourself. But oftentimes what I've, what I've discovered is that we're so out of focus. We're just, we're, we're, we're out of focus. We're not seeing, we're not perceiving the way that God Perceives. In fact, these three dimensions that God operates in and has given us the ability to operate in, I think we actually use it the wrong way. We're focusing on the wrong things. I want you to write these down because here's some areas we can get out of focus. You guys, you focus on the wrong things. There's, here's the first one. We put others under the microscope. Oh my gosh, right? It's, uh, it's really easy to put other people's lives in focus. It's really easy to fix everybody else's life and just see, oh, yeah, this is what you got. This is, what, this is how you do it. It's so hard. The microscope was not intended for you to, like, to, for you to like put other people under. It was intended for God to show you you, for God to reveal your heart. And there is nothing more exhausting than living around and being surrounded around critical people who have something to say about everything and everyone. They are like poison. It will suck the life. It's better to just remove that critical person because they will cause you to lose your focus if you're around them too much. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 3. He said, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Now, if you're seeing a speck in somebody's eye, how many of you know you got to be focused on the wrong things? you got to be intentionally focusing on somebody else's life. Like, you're becoming a speck inspector. An inspector. You're like, you're like looking, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And you're, you're missing what God wants to reveal in you because he says, you're actually ignoring the plank that's in your eye that I actually want to reveal to you. He says this in verse 5. You're a hypocrite. First, Remove the plank from your, put yourself under the microscope. And then he says this, then you're going to be able to remove the speck in your brother's eye. So yes, God actually wants you to help out your brother and sister. But before you help them out, you got to remove your plank because your helping will only hurt. If you put other people under the microscope, your helping will only hurt. There's a New Testament story, a story in the New Testament of a man named Simon who was this religious guy, a Pharisee who knew how to throw a great party, man. He welcomed Jesus to this banquet, and, and he kind of he had other people there as well, but he didn't do the normal customary things when you would invite, like, guests of honor to a banquet, like, like uh, you know, put a, give oil for his skin or, or, you know, have a servant or himself wash his, his feet, things like that. Like, like, it was customary for an honored guest that you were throwing a banquet, banquet for. He didn't do that. And then this this prostitute woman, you all probably remember the story, comes in. She's an uninvited guest, comes into this banquet that this religious guy, you know, created for these honored guests and religious people. And she comes in crawling and crying. And she makes her way to Jesus and like wets his feet with her tears. And she dries them with her hair. You remember this story, you guys? And, and, and Simon looks on her and he doesn't see a woman who is in need of forgiveness and, and hope. He sees all the things she's doing wrong. To let down your hair in that custom was, a, a, it was thought to be a seductive thing, something that was not intended to be done in public, to let down your hair like that. And so Jesus turns to Simon in Luke chapter 7, and he says, do you even see this woman? Like, do you see? Are you seeing? Like, because I don't think you see her. You're not seeing her the way I see her. See, some of you think you have discernment, and what you really have is pride and insecurity. You don't see this woman. 
Or maybe this woman, because you see the context, you see the story and stuff. This woman's easy to see, but what about the people you have under your microscope? What about, what about the people that you're sizing up in your life? What about the people that you don't see as people in need of forgiveness and love and grace, but people that you've sized up with your criticism and your microscope? Right there? Was that right there, guys? Yeah? 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, so we fix our eyes not on what we can see with our eyes. Hey, guys, let this be the year that we stop getting tripped up by these things, but that we will walk by faith and not by sight, man. If you would just fix your focus, I'm telling you, God can fix your future. Stop looking on what you can see, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Here's the second area we get out of focus, you guys, is we see our history through the kaleidoscope. What I mean by that is we don't understand what God is doing in our life. We can't put the pieces together and see the purpose or the plan of our past, like the pain and the hurts and the experiences and all those disappointments, and we don't see how God is actually working all those things for good. So we look back on our history, and it doesn't make sense and therefore, you stumble all over yourself. You're misinterpreting the plan of God, the purpose of God, and what he has brought you from. So this is so important. You guys got to grab this. Listen, anytime you visit a memory that is disconnected from the, from the life and death of Jesus Christ, the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're visiting a deception and you're giving room for the enemy in your life. Okay, let me say this again. Anytime that you visit a memory, you start to go back in your mind, in your past, and you do that disconnected from the reality of the grace, the love, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in your life, you're opening your life to a deception because that is not the reality anymore. You have been bought by the blood of Jesus. That has been redeemed. That has been restored. That has actually been turned around for good. Hebrews 12 says it like this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us, this year, this year, we're going to throw off everything that keeps hindering us. It's a weight that we don't need, you guys, this year. The sin that is easily entangling us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. There is a lane, a marked out race that God has for you. And if you cannot perceive what God is doing, if you cannot see what God has doing in the beautiful art, in the beauty he's creating out of your life, every hurt, every mistake, every failure, every success, every relationship, if you cannot see the good he's creating, you're going to stumble. You're going to stumble all over yourself. How do we, how do we stay in our lane then? How do, we, how do we keep running that race? Here's what he says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. One translation says the author and the finisher. Literally what it means is the beginning and the completion of our faith. So, so he is the, I got to fix my eyes on Jesus. He, be, he is my beginning and the end. And anything that I visit in my mind that, that is apart from the story that Jesus is writing from beginning to finish is not true. I need to fix my eyes upon Jesus. And when we don't, when we don't, we get distracted and we, we can't see what God is doing. You get out of step. You get out of focus. You're, you stop running. You might start off in your lane, but little by little, you kind of veer off in other people's lanes and, and you miss your mark. I was, I was reading about this this week. It's called the power of 1%. Just being 1% off. Because you could just be like 1% off and it can mess up Everything. Everything. You know, if you so so, I, I did some research on this. Uh, if if you're one percent off, like one percent off, and you're trying to go one foot, just one foot, you're you'd be off by zero point two inches. And some of you are like, "Well, that's easy, man. That's like a pivot," you know. But if you're going a distance of hundred yards, you'll be off by five point two feet. And then you're like, "Well, that's still that's like two steps," you know what I mean? But if you're going a distance of a mile, you're going to be off by ninety two feet. If you're just off 1%, 92 feet. And again, some of you are like, well, that's easy, man. It's just, I could just, go. easy. I can, of course, correct that. Pretty simple. But if you're going from Bakersfield to Washington, D.C., you're going to end up in Baltimore with 42 miles off target. 
Which again, some of you are like, 42 miles, easy drive. I like driving, Pastor. I mean, I can, of course, correct that. Okay, but I'm talking to people who want to actually see what God sees, who want, who want to see the impossible and the indescribable, to see the vision that God has. So, so I'm, I'm talking to people in the room that actually have bigger dreams than, than Washington, D.C., okay? So, so if you wanted to get in a rocket and go to the moon, you would be off, 1%, you'd be off by 4,169 miles. If you want to take a trip to the sun, I don't recommend it, but if you want to take a trip to the sun, you'd be off by 1.6 million miles. It's the pow- just the power of 1% of being out of focus, out of your lane, okay? What's, what's this, what's it? let me give you the last area. I think we just get out of focus, you guys, that we just need to, we need to refocus this year, right? Number three here, we have God in the telescope. See, the reality is for a lot of us, our relationship with God feels like that. It feels like a tele, like, like he's not close. You try to bring him close in moments like this, so you'll come to church or you're, you'll do things, You'll do certain things to try to get him close, like looking in, I'm going to bring him close by doing this thing. He doesn't, that's not what the telescope is for. The telescope is for the vision of God in your life. He wants to give you vision to see his plan and purpose to actually set a course for his plan. God's not, God's not intended for your, your telescope. He wants to be right next to you. He's intended for a relationship. Hebrews chapter 3 says it this way. That is why the Holy Spirit says today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. As Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience. Look at this. Even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So they said, you saw, you've seen it. They saw God move. You've seen God move. You've seen him move in your life. You've seen him move in other people's life. You've experienced God, yet still you have him so far away. So I was angry with them. And I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They're not close. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. God says, they will never enter my place of rest. We're out of focus. Okay, so if we're going to get our life back in focus, what does that look like? How do we do it? Over the next several weeks, I'm going to help us focus on the right things, you guys. And these these are going to be anchor messages for this entire year. But probably um, these next few weeks, you guys, are... Some of the most important messages probably I've ever preached, what God is revealing to me through his word about our focus, of what we need to be focused on. I prom- hey, your life, it, it could be different. You could be a, literally a totally different person this time next year if you just fix your focus, okay? But we got to start here. January 1, what are we going to focus on? Okay, we got to start here. Number one is this. We got to focus on what I do first, that's what we got to focus on. we got to focus on the first thing. See, this principle runs throughout all the Bible. It's called the principle of priority. We need to focus on the priorities that we have and what I'm doing first. Romans 12 and 2 says it like this. Fix your attention on God. Isn't that a beautiful statement, man? Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. See, a lot of people try it the other way. We try to change outside and we try to change, oh, if I fix these habits and I get this right, if I can fix this this year, then I'll change. No, nope, that's not how it works. You actually have to change you, and that'll change by itself, okay? You'll be changed from the inside out. And then he says this, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Doesn't that look a lot like our Proverbs 29 verse, that we are to recognize what God reveals and attend to it. See, God wants to show you the incomprehensible, the invisible, and the indescribable things that are far away. He wants to bring them close. The things that seem invisible, he wants to bring them to light. Invisible things that you can't even make sense of, he wants to bring purpose into it. Are you with me today, you guys? Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you. That's what he wants. He wants to bring the best. It's going to be the best year, I'm telling you. He develops well-formed maturity in you. And that can be, look, that can be, God can do that. God can develop well-formed maturity in you. That literally, at this time next year, like you could be, you could look back and go, I don't even recognize that person. Like that can happen. This well-formed maturity inside of you. But i got to focus on what I do first. If you focus on what you do first, what actually happens, it triggers all the rest. 
Okay, if you focus on the first is important, it's the principle of priority. Let me give you three ways that you can live this out. I'm challenging you to put first things first in three ways that you can live it out, all right? Number one is this, put God first, you guys. Put God first. I preach this all the time. All the time I preach this. Of all the things to have first, put God first. Now listen, I don't mean to like mess you up or anything this morning, but... Let me just tell you, if you have God in your life, but he's not first in your life, I hate to tell you this, he's not in your life. He's not. Look, look, it's, it's God is not on your list if he's not first on your list. God does not take any other place or platform or throne. He can only take First. He can only take priority. He can only take the place of the throne in every area of your life. He will not sit in any other seat. If you think that you have him in an area of your life and he's not first in that area of your life, he actually ain't in that area of your life. Are you guys hearing me, you guys? This is like, you got to put God, let this be the year, man, that we like, we put our, we fixed our focus and we actually put God first. This is what Christianity is about. Christian, Christianity in our faith is not about when you decide to go to church, you decide to read your Bible, you decide to do some Christian things. It's actually when Christianity is this. It's when you decided to reorder your entire life to reflect the reality God's first. My entire life reflects this. God is first. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Now, I know I'm taking this a little out of context, but I think there's truth in this scripture in Genesis 1-1. These first four words of the Bible, if you make this your life mantra, in the beginning, God. Now, I know, I know it's out of context, but look at this. Isn't this powerful? Like, like, what if we just made this our life mantra that in the beginning, God. Every, like in every beginning, in every hour, in the beginning, God. The first of the Ten Commandments was this, Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord. Here's the first one. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God goes, I went first. I did that. I did it before you came to me. So you shall have no other gods, little g gods, before me, okay? That's a little g god, meaning he doesn't want you to have other loves and other passions. And, and Now, he doesn't mind you loving other things. He just minds you loving things more than him, okay? Because he's not going to take any other place in your heart than the love of your life. No other place. In the beginning, God. Put God first. How do you do that? Let me show you how. Number two, give God the first of everything. Give him the first of everything. Now, a lot of preachers preach this to get money out of you, <laughs> but this isn't even a money principle, you guys. Money is on the list, but it's not even the most important thing on the list to give God the first things up. And I don't even, a lot of times the tithe isn't even taught, right? In churches, sure, it's about, it's good for your budget, it's good for advancing the kingdom, but God says over and over in the scriptures, I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for something bigger than that. Look at Leviticus chapter 27 and 30 says, a tithe of what? Of everything. So it's not just one area. God's like, I don't need the time and just like, I don't want you to just give me the first of that. I want you to give me the first of your thoughts. I want you to give me the first of your time. I want you to give me the first of your day. I want you to give me the first of everything from the land, whether grain or soil or trees or whatever. It all belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. It is specially set apart from God. Deuteronomy 14 and 23 says this, the purpose of tithing is actually to teach you to always put God what? First place in your life. So praise God. It does projects and feeds people and accomplishes ministry and stuff like that. But that's not the area where we should even be thinking about tithing. Let me give you some areas that, that if this is the year that you're going to get in focus and you're going to do this first things first, you're going to put God first, let me give you some areas that you need to start putting God first first in. Write these down. The first area is this. I'm going to put God in the first of my year. Like, and here you are on January 1st. Come on, you are 100%, one of one, okay? I'm going to put God first in my year. How do we do that? We begin the year every, every year the same way, prayer and fasting. Here's what I want to encourage you to do, giving God the first of the year. Before you set plans, goals, agendas, and stuff like that, start praying and fasting. Pray and fast. Seek God. See, here's why it's important. You may want to write this down. A diet changes how you look, but fasting changes how you see. Okay, if this, if this is going to be the year of focus, focus, you guys, then, then I'm encouraging you to include 
fasting as a new spiritual rhythm for you, something that you introduce into your faith and into your rhythm. How, and, and, and there's actually this, uh, this prayer and fasting. We begin 21 days of prayer and fasting every January, starting today. This is in your bulletin. You can grab it. It actually explains a lot about fasting and what fast you can, you can do. A lot of people ask, like, well, what fast do I do? What do I do? And I, I don't like to be descriptive on the fast, like telling you what fast to do. I'm just more prescriptive, like just fast, just, just do it, do it fast, right? And here's the question, will you give up something good for something better, okay? Like it's easy to give us something that's not good, you know what I mean? Will you give us something good though for something better? Like, like, if, something is, <laughs> like if something is illegal and you say, well, I'm going to fast doing this illegal thing. Come on, I would just hope that you would just stop doing that illegal thing and just kind of pick a different fast item, Okay. Um, so if something is like unhealthy or illegal, just like stop and then try something else to, <laughs> to, to fast. There's just something about saying no. Something about, about and I'm not going to let my feelings and my flesh drive me. Like if I don't do this, then oh, I just I, I unravel. No, man, I'm, I'm going to allow, like when my craving happens, I'm not going to go to that thing that I'm craving for. I'm going to turn that craving toward God and let him satisfy the craving of my heart. Oh, so, that's, that's a powerful when you do that, when you allow God to satisfy your craving and the flesh to satisfy. That's the power of fasting. So we're going to give God the first of our year, and I encourage you to do that. If you want to put God first, go on this journey, 21 days of prayer and fasting with us. Here's the next area. Put God first in your month. Put God first in your month. So how do we do that? Write this down. Scheduling and budgeting. I gave you a lot of extra space in your notes. You can just write some of these down, guys. Scheduling. This is a discipline Veronica and I have learned. We make sure that God is in our schedules. See, when you are not intentional and you're not, you're not putting God in the rightful place, some of you, out, you've outscheduled God. You've, you've said yes to so many other commitments that you cannot even say yes to God when he's knocking on your heart. Like you've said yes to so many things that you cannot say yes to community with God's people. You've said yes to so many other commit, uh, commitments that you cannot say yes to making a difference for God's kingdom serving anywhere, doing anything for God, because you've got all these other commitments. So I'm not going to out-schedule God. I'm going to make sure that God is on my schedule. This month, I'm looking at my schedule. God is getting the priority of my schedule. And he's getting the priority of my budgeting. Like, he's going to become first in this house. We are going to give God the first of everything. We're going to honor God with our finances before everything else. Here's another area. Write this down. The first of our week. We can give God the first of our week. This is one of the reasons why... The Sabbath was actually moved from Saturday, which in the Old Testament, the Sabbath was Saturday, and then it got moved to Sunday. And the reason, the reason why it was moved, the early church moved, like gathering as God's people, worshiping and hearing the teaching of God's word on a Sunday, because Jesus rose from the grave on a Sunday, but also it was this priority principle that they said, I, we're not going to end our week giving you know, God worship, we're going to begin, we're going to give him the first of our week to give God Worship. What would your life look like if you made it a habit of the first of every week coming to church? Like, what if you actually spent 52 Sundays this year worshiping God in church? You'd be a lot healthier spiritually, I bet you that. You'd be a lot more aligned in your heart and your life and with God's, God's, God's uh, vision. You would. Okay, what, what would that look like, man, if we just gave God the first of our week? And I'll take it a step further, not just worshiping, but resting. Don't just give God an hour on Sunday, give him the whole day. Give him the whole day. Like rest, stop, cease. Like come, worship, serve, but then stop your working and your grinding because you can get more done with six days and God as Lord of your life and giving that day to rest than seven days of you grinding. I promise you, you can get more productive when God is in control. We're going to give God, if we want to put God first, here's what we got to do. Put God first in your year. Put God first in your month. Put God first in your week. Let's go down even further. Let's put God first in our day. We're going to put God first in our day. Every day, if you have time for nothing, just let the first words and thoughts be, God, thank you. God, thank you. God, I love you. Just let the first words and the first thoughts be of God. But spend time with God at the first part of your day. Now, I know you can spend God, time with God any time of the day. You can afternoon, evening. But there's something powerful about giving God the first of your day. I'm just saying there is something powerful about before you do get in, get in your emails and, and get ahead on office stuff or, or, or go do whatever else that you have in your priority. When you give God 
first, there was something powerful to that. I've been teaching this for years, for 10 years now. I've been teaching, give God the first of everything. Give God the first of your day. I'll even give you a simple outline I've taught before. Give God, I call it the first 15 minutes of your day. Every one of us can do that. We can give God the first 15 minutes. Give five minutes to worship, five minutes to prayer, and five minutes to the word of God. That's it. What would your life look like if you just stopped grinding? You woke up, man, and you gave God the first. You spent time in worship, spent time in intentional prayer, and spent time in God's word. I'm telling you, man, you'd, be, you'd have focus. Oh, you, you get to perceive. You start to perceive what God is doing. You'd stop stumbling all over the place during the day, right? And, and, and it's not them that are tripping you up or that that's tripping you up. You, you, you kind of realize it's me. I'm stumbling over me, man. I just need to, I need to get in focus. I need to put my life in order. And here's what we're going to do. Number three, we've got to expect God to bless the rest. Yeah, yeah. Like when I put God first, it actually triggers the rest. God will bless the rest. When you give him the first, he multiplies it. When you give him the first of your time, I know some of you are like, oh, 15 minutes. I don't got 15 minutes of margin. I'm rushing out the door, pastor. No, no, no. Here's what you need to understand. Anything you give God to, he gives back to you in multiplication. Anything. When you give God, I promise you, trust me. I love you. I want, I want you to have the most blessed year of your life. And this is important, that you would put first things in order. And if you gave God the first of your time, you, you'd see that actually you have more time at the end of the day. Somehow it'll work out. And it won't be because like he added minutes to the day. He actually, what's going to happen is he's adding focus. He's adding alignment to it. So you're not getting as easily distracted. You're able to attend to what he reveals. You're able to stay in alignment with God to see the, the invisible, the incomprehensible, the indescribable. Give God the first of anything and he multiplies. He blesses the rest. You will be most blessed. Proverbs 3 says it like this. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Honor the Lord with your wealth, and not just with that, but with the first fruits, he calls it, right? The first of everything, of all, all your crops. Like, just, get, just put him first in your life. Then your barns are going to be filled with overflowing. You're going to have multiplied. You're going to have more than enough, man. Your vats will brim over with new wine. Hey, this is the year, you guys, I'm telling you. This is the year. Let's, let's let it be this year for us, a year of focus. That if we can just get, get focused, not on this, not, not get tra- trapped and, and, and tripped up with our eyes, with, with what we see in temporal and this earthly stuff, man, but we focus on the things that are not seen, that we attend to really what God reveals, that what God sees, the, the God of the impossible revealing to us the things that are so far away, bringing them close, that those, those incomprehensible that he wants to reveal, the things that are indescribable that we can't make sense in our life, that as we attend to what he reveals, he starts to bring texture and color and art and tapestry to the pain and, and even the failures and the difficulties and, and the things that are so close that, that we don't even see that keep tripping us up, that God will start, he'll start revealing if you get in focus. Come on, let's be the year that we fix our focus. We let God fix our future. Let's stop trying to fix it ourselves and and work on this habit. Let me do this goal. I'm going to change this. And this is what I'm going to do next. And and this is this. What if we just stop trying to fix all that and we just let God fix me? God, fix me. I'm going to fix my focus and you're going to fix the future. I'm just going to. Can we do that together? Can we go on a journey this year, you guys, of fixing our focus? Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.